Next, we're going to talk about a functional group called ethers. We'll discuss their physical properties, we'll discuss uh, how to synthesize them, and then we'll talk about the reactions they undergo. <clears throat> an ether is defined as a functional group that has an oxygen with a carbon group on either side. And so because this has no OH group like an alcohol, it cannot undergo hydrogen bonding between ether molecules. So that's going to be a very big difference. Uh, what it's really going to be doing, because we have no hydrogen bonding, is we're going to see a decrease in boiling points of ethers when compared to alcohols. However, it is a polar molecule. So when we think about the hybridization of that oxygen, it's tetrahedral, it's sp3 hybridized. <clears throat> And so these are both polar bonds, and so there is a net dipole moment, and so ethers um, are polar molecules. We'll, we'll see that they make very good solvents for that reason. And because of the oxygen that they contain, they can accept hydrogen bonds from water. So although an ether cannot hydrogen bond with another ether molecule, it can be uh, a hydrogen bond acceptor meaning if there was another molecule with an OH bond, like water, then we can have uh, a hydrogen bond forming between the partial negative oxygen and the partial positive hydrogen. So that means the interaction between water and an ether molecule is very good, and so we expect to have some water solubility as a result. So let's take a look at some boiling points. And again, I, uh, we, we've seen some of these molecules in the past when we're looking at alcohols. I think it's still very useful to compare alcohols and ethers um, because they are both oxygen containing functional groups. So the simplest ether we can have here is dimethyl ether and you can see that um, there's very little attraction between dimethyl ether um, molecules so that the boiling point is minus 24 degrees C. That means at room temperature this is a gas. So the simplest uh, ether is not a, a liquid. Um, it's only when we get to diethyl ether which has about the same molecular weight as pentane that we get to um, a, uh, a liquid form. So just like alkanes, you have to have a significant molecular weight before um, you have a strong enough intermolecular attractions because of those van der Waal forces that you're going to be uh, maintained as a liquid at room temperature. Okay, so you can see these have about the same molecular weight and they have about the same boiling point. So even though this is a, a slightly more polar molecule, you can see there's not a, a huge attraction between ether molecules um, because it has about the same boiling point as if it didn't have an oxygen at all, just a plain old alkane. <clears throat> uh, however, when we go from uh, diethyl ether to this one, this is called MTBE for short. We have a methyl over here and we have a tert-butyl over here and sometimes that is a, a way that we can have a common name for an ether is we simply list the two alkyl groups on either side of the ether. So just like we call this diethyl ether, this is um, commonly known as methyl, ter methyl tert-butyl ether. And uh, you can see that we have a jump in our boiling point and the reason for that now is we are increasing our molecular weight. So as usual, as we increase our molecular weight, we increase our boiling point. Uh, but you can see that all of these are so much lower boiling than something like ethanol, even though this is a very small molecule. The fact that it has an OH group means that um, it can undergo hydrogen bonding. And that is, that's the, really the number one thing you want to look for for uh, effects, things that affect the boiling point because it's such a strong intermolecular attraction. It's going to have huge impacts on the boiling point temperature. Um, now, I mentioned MTBE because this is uh, something, this, these letters are something you might see on a, a gas um, dispenser at, at a gas station. This is a fuel additive. And uh, we're, uh, we look for um, oxygenated fuel additives to affect the uh, efficiency of the burning and how cleanly it burns and whether or not it knocks and all those sorts of things. There are a variety of things that go into gasoline mixtures other than just the plain old hydrocarbons that um, is really all you need to do to do the combustion part. Um, but uh, what we can see on the next slide, when we look at the water solubility of these ethers, we find that because it can accept hydrogen bonding, we, we do have some water solubility. So um, again, comparing our pentane to our diethyl ether, we go from something that is completely nonpolar to something that is polar and can accept hydrogen bonds. And suddenly 
we, um, we have a decent interaction with water and we, we do get some water solubility. About eight grams of ethyl ether, diethyl ether can dissolve in about a hundred, in a hundred milliliters of water. Um, and uh, I discussed this a little before when we looked at this molecule for um, looking at the alcohol boiling points. Just a little note here that anytime we do an extractive workup in a reaction, our ether layer, when we say we're using ether in a reaction or ether as a solvent, this is the ether we're talking about is diethyl ether. This is the one we most commonly use and, and it is referred to as just plain ether. Um, and when we do an extractive workup, like in a SEP funnel where we have e both ether and water, we'll note that the ether layer is wet, meaning it contains water. And so, uh, and, and it must be dried as part of your um, workup procedure in order to isolate your product from that, from that organic layer, that ether layer. Um, and, uh, and, and we, we expect alcohols to be uh, fairly, fairly soluble in water, but again, depending on the length of our polar and nonpolar, we see uh, you know, increased solubility when we have uh, a miscible, uh, uh, increased solubility when we have a lo lo smaller nonpolar group. So this, because it has a large nonpolar region, that's going to decrease the water solubility. Um, but, but a smaller alcohol like ethanol is um, going to be miscible. And uh, we're back to showing MTBE, and what's interesting about MTBE is that because it's an ether, it has some water solubility. Even though it has this terp-butyl group, it's kind of compact and won't interrupt, disrupt the water molecules too much. Um, and so uh, what's, in, what's interesting about this is if you have a component in your gasoline that is water soluble, then if that gasoline were ever to spill onto the ground, or if it were to leak from a, a, you know, a container, then this component is something that can make its way into the groundwater and, uh, because it's soluble in water. And so be, the reason MTBE, is, you might find some of that in the news or, or an issue of um, discussion, is because uh, MTBE uh, is very de easily detected by humans uh, at very, very low concentrations. And so if you get some of this in your water supply, it, the water's gonna taste a little funny or smell a little funny. Of course, that's unacceptable to a uh, consumer. So it's not that this is necessarily something that's gonna be real bad for you, but if it's something that um, you know, gives, a, gives your water a, a bad taste, then this is something that, that we need to find replacements for. So there's a lot of research going into just, just the perfect kind of oxida oxygenated um, structure that's going to uh, improve our, our gasoline performance, but not be something that uh, has significant water solubility. How would we synthesize uh, an ether structure? There are a few options that we have for us. One of the most common ways is something known as the Williamson ether synthesis. And here's an example of it. If we take an alkoxide, so in other words, we have an RO minus, an alkoxide, and we react it with an alkyl halide. Looks like we have a perfect situation for a nucleophile, electron-rich negative charge, coming together with an electrophile, right? This carbon bearing the leaving group is partially positive. Electrophile and nucleophile coming together, and they're going to react. What reaction mechanism would you expect to happen for these pair of compounds? Well, I would expect that my lone pair of my oxygen can attack that partially positive carbon, the electrophilic carbon, and kick off the leaving group. Looks like backside attack, looks like an SN2 mechanism. And that can happen quite nicely. What product do we get? Well, our methoxy group has replaced our bromine. And uh, how would you describe the structure we just made? We just made an ether. So um, this is one thing that's very useful to, to note is that if you take an alkoxide and an alkyl halide, you can make an ether by doing an SN2 mechanism. So that's um, very good to keep in mind and it's gonna be very useful to us when we're trying to make a variety of ethers. So um, an example of this strategy would be to start with this uh, alcohol. Step one, we react the alcohol with NaH, sodium hydride. That looks like we have H minus. Where have we seen sodium hydride before? This is a very good base. This is a very good base. We've seen it as a way to convert an alcohol to uh, an alkoxide. In other words, this can be used to deprotonate the oxygen and form an alkoxide. 
And once we have an alkoxide, now in step two, we could ha add uh, phenyl CH2I, that is benzyl iodide. There's our electrophile. So if we react our alkoxide with our alkyl halide, we can do an SN2. And we've just created an ether. So this would be a way of um, going from an alcohol to an ether, make the alkoxide, and react it with an alcoholide. Let's look at another example. How about if we had not just an alcohol, but we had this structure that has both a chlorine, a leaving group, and an alcohol in the same structure, and we react this with something that can act as a base. That can act as a base. Now, one thing you might imagine is that hydroxide can also act as a nucleophile, and so the hydroxide might come right out and want to attack the carbon and kick off the leaving group, okay? And while that is a reaction that can happen, there's another reaction that's going to be happening faster, and that is the acid-base reaction, okay? Acid-base reactions are the fastest reactions we can have, so if there's a possibility of that, that's the first thing path we want to take. So in other words, what's going to happen is it's going to act as a base and it's going to deprotonate. Now, this is not a strong enough base like sodium hydride to 100% deprotonate the alcohol. Okay, but we'll set up an equilibrium. We'll form some of this O minus to give us to generate some of this alkoxide. Now, what that does for us is that makes an excellent nucleophile. This oxygen is now negatively charged. And guess what? If we see in the same structure, we see a partially positive carbon, we see an electrophile, then we can have an intramolecular reaction take place if those two are properly um, separated, properly situated. So let's see what size ring we would form. Anytime we have an intramolecular reaction between a nucleophile and an electrophile, that means we're going to form a ring. We would be forming with the, this oxygen, would be forming a one, two, three, four, five-membered ring, turns out that is a great size ring to form. So we, we do expect this reaction to happen. And as usual, an SN2 like this, a backside attack kicking off a good leaving group is not going to be a, a reversible reaction. Kicking off that better leaving group is going to be what drives this reaction in the forward direction. So even though this deprotonation is, is um, reversible and maybe we'll just form a very small concentration of this alkoxide, the fact that as soon as the alkoxide is formed, it can do an SN2 and uh, to give this product, then, uh, then that's something that, that uh, forces the reaction in the forward direction and does make this a favorable reaction. So we can number our atoms one, two, three, four, five, so you can, so you can follow along to see um, how we just made that ring. Um, so we can describe this as an intramolecular SN2. Really, it's better described just as an intramolecular backside attack, but it's similar to our SN2 mechanism. And when it's intramolecular, it's going to give cyclic ethers. Um, and it, how, when can we have such cyclization reactions? Remember, we can have it if we have a very, very small ring, like a three-membered ring, and that's where our nucleophile and our electrophile are just so close to each other that they will react. Okay, but then we jump to five or six-membered rings as our best ones because those have very little ring strain, little to no ring strain. So it's going to be a very favorable transition state, very low energy, and, and will be a fast reaction. Okay, and when you consider that this intermolecular SN2 could have taken place, um, wh what we'll find is that the intramolecular reaction is always going to be favored. If there is a possibility for an intramolecular reaction, that's going to be the favorable reaction. That will be our major product, and that's simply a factor of entropy the fact that we do, don't have the, the nucleophile and the electrophile are tethered together, they're already connected, means that they do no longer have to come together and collide um, uh, randomly. So b because it's so, so well favored entropically, when we see an intramolecular reaction as an option, that's the one we should go for as the major product, okay? How would I, might, might I be suspicious here? Look, we have a single starting material here and has two functional groups. It has something that is potentially nucleophilic and something is potentially electrophilic. So that's something that you would really want to tip off to, hey, let's, let's consider an intramolecular reaction. So when we have a halo alcohol and we treat it with any kind of base, we can get uh, a cyclic ether being formed. Okay, so um, if we wanted to plan a synthesis, how do we go about that? Well, knowing that we can do a Williamson ether synthesis, um, 
the disconnection that we would make to form an ether would be either one of these carbon carbon uh, I'm sorry carbon oxygen bonds so we would disconnect on either side of the oxygen so we make a disconnection remember we're asking what starting materials do I need in this retrosynthesis and uh, when we consider these two atoms that we're trying to bring it together in the in the reaction we're trying to react an oxygen with a carbon well the oxygen of course is electron rich that makes a great nucleophile this was my nucleophile and this was my electrophile and what we should go backwards to is to make this oxygen a good nucleophile we use the alkoxide and to make this carbon a good electrophile we use an alkyl halide So an alkoxide plus an alkyl halide gives an ether. An alkoxide plus an alkyl halide gives an ether. And so that means if we have an ether target molecule, our retrosynthesis, one possible retrosynthesis would be go backwards to the corresponding alkoxide and alkyl halide. <clears throat> so let's see a sample ether. Um, because this is not a symmetrical ether, there's two possible disconnections. I could disconnect this carbon-oxygen bond. Let's call that disconnection A. We're going back to some kind of alkoxide and alkyl halide. The group on the right is obviously my oxygen-containing group. So that would be my alkoxide. That would be my nucleophile. And what would that nucleophile be reacting with? It would be this one carbon alkyl halide. So CH3, we, let's uh, pick any halogen. I think the iodide is the best choice because it's just the methyl, and that's a, a liquid reagent. So this combination of alkoxide and alkyl halide would combine to give this ether target molecule. Okay, but there's another disconnection. We can go on this side, and as our synthesis form, this is our new carbon oxygen bond. So let's consider that synthesis as well. If we disconnected here, then it would be the methoxy group that would come in as my nucleophile. That would be my alkoxide. And what would it react with? We need an alkyl halide. We need this three carbon alkyl halide. Again, your choice, fluor uh, bromine, chlorine, iodine, any halogen that you want is fine. Okay, so there's two possible disconnections. Are they both equally good? Well, in order to answer that question, we need to think, of, imagine doing the synthesis then and taking this reaction, taking uh, isopropoxide and methyl iodide and combining the two, what reaction do you expect to have happen? We know we want to do an SN2 mechanism. Is this good, a good SN2 mechanism? Backside attack is very sensitive to steric hindrance. We want to make sure there's very little steric hindrance. So we look at this, um, at the carbon bearing the leaving group. That's the carbon that needs to get approached by the nucleophile. This is a methyl leaving group. Is that good for an SN2? It's the best, fastest SN2 we can have. This is a great SN2. So I would expect this to work very nicely to give uh, the target molecule. Okay, how about the second case? Again, we want to do an SN2 or alkoxide needs to attack the alkyl halide. How would you describe the carbon bearing the leaving group in uh, synthesis B? Here we have a secondary leaving group. Clearly has more steric hindrance now. We have these two methyl groups we need to get around. And remember that an alkoxide is a nucleophile, but it's also a very good base. It's a very strong base. And so what we have with methoxide, just like we would have for hydroxide, we have a competition between the SN2 and the E2. If it acts as a base, in other words, instead of attacking the carbon bearing the leaving group, if it attacked one of these beta hydrogens and formed a pi bond and kicked out the leaving group, that would be the E2. And in fact, the E2 for secondary is major. So what would my product look like? I would get a CH2, CH, CH3. I would get an elimination reaction instead. Okay, so which is my better synthesis? A 
is the better retrosynthesis. because it leads to the better SN2 mechanism, less sterics. Okay, so anytime we come across an ether that is not symmetrical, we need to consider both possible disconnections and then um, choose the one that, that gives the alkyl halide that is less sterically hindered. So we've done our plan. We said that this is the better plan up here as a way to make our target molecule. So let's do the synthesis then, because our goal was to, uh, to synthesize this target molecule. So what we need is methyl iodide and propoxide, isopropoxide. Where does isopropoxide come from, you think? How could I make isopropoxide if that was not commercially available? I think I would start with isopropanol, and I would need to deprotonate that to make the propoxide, to make the alkoxide. Um, how do I deprotonate? Need some kind of strong base. How about sodium hydroxide? Is that a nice strong base that would completely deprotonate my alcohol? No, that's not strong enough because we can't make this RO minus from this HO minus. So what would be a better base? We saw sodium hydride being used to make alkoxide. Or remember, we also saw sodium metal as an option to do a redox reaction. You can make an alkoxide that way, okay? So we need some super strong base that's not going to be reversible. That makes my uh, alkoxide. And what did I do with that alkoxide? I'm going to add the methyl iodide to do my SN2, and that's going to give me my target molecule. Okay, so ether synthesis is a very nice uh, illustration of how to do um, different retrosyntheses and evaluate your choices before carrying on. Let's try another one. Starting with propanol as the only source of carbon. What is propanol? Three carbons with an OH. As the only source of carbon, synthesize dipropyl ether. Dipropyl ether means I have a propyl group on one side and a propyl group on the other side. One, two, whoop, three. So this is dipropyl ether. That's my target molecule, TM. And it asks us to synthesize it, but it gives us a restriction on where the sources of carbon uh, can come from. So we have to consider that when we're doing our, um, our synthesis. Okay, and this should really start, a synthesis problem really should start the same way every time, and that's by doing a retrosynthesis, planning your synthesis first. So what starting materials do I need? to make this target molecule. Well, I recognize that this is an ether, and so what starting materials could I use to make an ether? What are the two ingredients? Alkoxide plus an alkyl halide. Now, I can disconnect this one on either side. Uh, it would give the same set of alkoxide and alkyl halide. I need this propoxide as my alkoxide, in this case, N-propoxide, and my alkyl halide would be one, two, three carbons Bromine, chlorine, iodine, your choice. So the planning is very useful because it tells me where I have to go. I know that I need this alkoxide. I know that I need this alkyl halide. And if I had free range to a stock room, maybe I could just go and ask for both of those. But since I know I have to start from propanol, I need to um, create, I need to synthesize both of them. So here's my synthesis. I'll start with uh, propanol, and let's uh, first make the alkyl halide. How do I go from propanol to bromopropane? Propanol to bromopropane looks like a substitution reaction. This, in fact, is a conversion we've seen for the, for the uh, reactions of alcohols. We saw a few different uh, strategies for this. The most direct one would be to use one of the reagents that does it just as a one-pot transformation, something like PBr3. Okay, of course, if you remembered SOCl2 and you wanted to use that thionyl chloride, then you could use that as well. We just picked a halide here. So whichever halide you want to use would be great. <clears throat> uh, this is another case where HBr, although tempting, because we're probably more familiar with that reagent, HBr would probably not be a very good choice because we have this primary alcohol and it's very likely that the, um, after we protonate the OH, it could leave 
lose water along with rearrangement to give a secondary carbocation so we could get a mixture, we could get some rearranged product here and, and we wouldn't necessarily get this as the only bromide. Okay, so PBR3 is a way to get this um, bromopropane. How do we get the alkoxide? We need to start with alcohol again. We need to start with the propanol. The way, way we go from the propanol to the propoxide is we need that strong base again, something like sodium hydride. Your choice, sodium hydride, sodium metal, just pick one and go with it. A lot, a lot of times there's going to be more than one choice for reagents. And, uh, and then we're gonna, we can combine these two and uh, make our target molecule. We could just kind of follow this one and use the um, bromopropane that we already showed how to make up here. And we do our SN2 to do our target molecule. Great SN2 because it's a primary alkyl halide. and uh, so that we would expect the synthesis to work pretty well. Okay, here's one more. Let's transform the following. Uh, we start with this alcohol and we go to this ether. Okay, and what's um, very tempting when you see a problem like this as a transform type problem is to start with your starting material and, and just kind of move forward and say, well, um, I have the OH. How about if I just make the alkoxide with my sodium hydride. I know how to make an ether. All I need to do is have an alkoxide and then I add in my alkyl halide. Uh, here it's a three carbon chain with another uh, methyl here. Let chloride bromide iodide, my choice. Um, add my alkoxide, my alkyl halide and I'm done. So what do you think? Is this synthesis going to work? Well, we have a good nucleophile. How would you describe the carbon bearing the leaving group? It's a tertiary RX. How good is that SN2? Impossible SN2. No SN2 on a tertiary center. So this reaction would not work. What would happen instead is you would, um, you would form the alkene from the tert butyl bromide. You would make the alkene because uh, you would do an E2 instead of an SN2. Okay, so, so I think the reason um, that we, students are most likely to make a mistake on a problem like this is because they forgot to plan. And if you're doing any kind of a synthesis problem or transformation problem, you need to start by making a plan and think about where you're going. And if you had made a plan, then you would look at this target molecule, which is an ether, and you would have asked, how can I make this ether? And you would realize that there's two possible disconnections and the better disconnection is the one here because that's going to lead to a more, more um, sterically available, less sterically crowded alkyl halide. So if I put the leaving group on this carbon and I use the oxygen as part of my terp butyl group, this combination of alkoxide and alkyl halide would work great. This is a great SN2. We have a benzylic primary uh, alkyl halide, fantastic for the SN2. Uh, even though this is kind of bulky, it, uh, there's no elimination that can take place. This is going to be something that will work very well to make our target molecule. Okay, so what do we need to do with the, this benzyl alcohol then? What we need to do is we need to convert it to benzyl chloride. We need to convert this to benzyl chloride. Um, and how can we do that? Well, uh, again, SOCl2 is our best choice because that, that's going to work um, more often than, than the others. Um, but in this case, if we used HCl, that would uh, work pretty well because um, there's there's no other rearrangements that can occur. This is the only product that you can ha that you can form. Remember, sometimes we need that zinc chloride in here, though, as a catalyst. Or maybe we just make the bromide instead, instead of the chloride. Okay, but yes, we can convert the alcohol to our alcohol halide, and now we can add in uh, the alkoxide we needed, terpetoxide. Potassium terpetoxide is going to be the reagent that we use most most uh, commonly when we need the to that alkoxide, and uh, we would expect to form the target molecule very nicely. Okay, so please do consider.
planning and, and thinking about a retrosynthesis and, and because you might have a choice of which, which bonds to form in your reaction and which sets of nucleophiles and electrophiles that you can use. Now, if we take a look at epoxides, these are a, a special, unique class of ethers, and that is the cyclic ether when we have a three-membered ring. Uh, this is known as an epoxide, and so um, we're going to talk specifically about the synthesis of epoxides, and later we're going to see some reactions that are unique to epoxides. Okay, if we wanted to make a three-membered ring um, ether, well, we could do it the same way we've seen our other um, ether formations, Williamson ether synthesis. Okay, but this would have to be an intramolecular case. So uh, the way we would get the, the uh, ingredients in place, the intramolecular, the, in, the, the nucleophile and the electrophile on the same carbon chain, is uh, we could do that very nice way, starting with an alkene and we're reacting with bromine and water. Now, what does this do to an alkene? Bromine at, reacts with the alkene to form the bromonium ion. And then water as our solvent is going to come in and open up that bromonium ion. So this adds a bromine and an OH across the pi bond. Now where does that water go? Let's just do a quick review here of this mechanism. We have this bromine, this bromonium ion intermediate. We have two choices here on where the water can attack, the nucleophile can attack. Where is it going to want to go? We saw that because of this positive charge, it goes to the more partially positive carbon, which means the more substituted carbon. So we saw the regiochemistry of this reaction was, was very similar to Markovnikov's um, regiochemistry, where instead of H plus, we're dealing with a Br plus. That goes to the carbon with more hydrogens. And the nucleophile, in this case, water goes to the more substituted internal carbon. OK, so this adds a Br and an OH. And what would happen if I took this molecule and reacted with some kind of base like sodium hydroxide? Well, I would expect to deprotonate that uh, alcohol. And then I would expect to do an intramolecular displacement backside attack. And remember, three membered rings were OK for, forming, for doing this intramolecular attack. Even though there's ring strain in this, epo this epoxide, the fact that that oxygen and the carbon bearing the leaving group are so close they are overlapping. There's no way for that reaction to not happen. So, so this would be a suitable way to make an epoxide um, and, and probably would be starting with an alkene as a way to get the, the OH and the BR into the structure. Okay, but we've also seen another reaction that gives epoxides specifically as products, and that is via oxidation of the um, alkene. We learned about MCPBA as a peroxide reagent. It's a peroxy acid. And we learned that when an alkene sees a peroxy acid, it gets converted to an epoxide. So we could use, uh, you know, which one, which synthesis would we use? It depends on the complexity of the rest of our molecule. If something, uh, can, if the rest of the molecule can tolerate uh, MCPBA or oxidative conditions, then this might be the simpler path. But there are other paths that are more acidic, you know, uh, acid-base type conditions rather than uh, oxidative conditions. So either of these would be useful for synthesizing an epoxide ring. So now that we know how to make ethers, let's think about the reactions that ethers can undergo. Uh, and, and there's not a long list to talk about here. Ethers are, are generally very, very stable. They're not too reactive. That's because they have no leaving group. So, you know, if you compare them to something like an alcohol halide, uh, which can undergo substitutions, eliminations. There is no leaving group here. There's also no acidic protons like we might have in an alcohol, where that can be the source of some of our reactions. Okay, so they're really quite unreactive, which means um, that they make very good solvents uh, because they, they don't do a lot of reactions themselves because they're polar. Uh, that, that helps for, for properties of a solvent. So in other words, if we take an ether, we try and react with a nucleophile, or we try and react with a base, or maybe some of the oxidation conditions we've seen for alcohols like PCC or Swern or Jones oxidation. Um, w nothing's going to happen here. No reaction. Okay, so there's, there's very few reactions that ethers can undergo. Uh, and one of the only reactions that we're going to be studying is this one. 
and that is the reaction with uh, either HBr or HI. Now, what's the difference between all the reagents that I was just suggesting on the previous um, slide? The difference here is that HBr and HI are both strong acids, and so that is the one uh, uh, vulnerability of an ether is that it, it is subject to reaction with a strong acid. And the reaction that happens is we see that we cleave our ether apart. We break both of these bonds and we replace the oxygen bond <coughs> on both sides with a bromine on both sides or an iodine if we're using HI. So let's see if we can come up with a mechanism for this. What will happen if we take an ether and we expose it to a strong acid? Well, same thing that happens with any, uh, anything exposed to a strong acid, we're going to protonate it. So the ether will act as a base. HBr is going to act as an acid. And so step one of our mechanism is protonate. Now we've seen this happening for alcohols. So let's use that as our analogy. And what happened when we protonated an alcohol? When we protonated an alcohol, it turned the OH group into a water molecule that's attached, which made it a very good le leaving group. Well, guess what? We have the same thing here. This is also a good leaving group because if it left, it would leave as an ethanol molecule. Again, a very stable, neutral molecule. So by protonating, we turn this into a good leaving group, and because HBr is a source of not only the acid, but also of Br minus, that Br minus is going to see a carbon with a good leaving group attached to it, and it's going to do a substitution. Now the substitution, I kind of jumped the gun here, uh, it can be either an SN1 or SN2 substitution with the good leaving group, and that is simply going to depend on the substrate where um, we're given because this is a methyl group, has a very low steric hindrance, backside attack is great, and carbocation is awful. So in this case, it's going to be an SN2 mechanism, and we're going to be uh, forming one of our products. So we just uh, brominated this, uh, this methyl group. We have bromomethane as a product. And uh, what else did we form? We just kicked off a molecule of ethanol. Again, very stable, great leaving group. So this is how we can cleave an ether with uh, HBr and HI. But if we have an excess of this, if we have uh, plenty of this to go around, then this alcohol that's formed in the reaction does not stick around because we've seen a reaction of alcohols with HBr. What happens? The, we replace the OH with that halide. So what's going to happen is we're going to repeat the process our alcohol under these conditions is also going to get protonated. So we're going to protonate the alcohol. And now this rest of this mechanism, this is simply a reaction we've seen for alcohols. We protonate the OH. We make it a good leaving group. And because we have bromide around, we have something that can substitute for that leaving group. Again, the second part of the mechanism can be SN1. It could be SN2. Because in this case, we have a primary. It's going to be SN2. And uh, our bromide can come in and attack and kick off our water molecule. And that's how we get our other alcoholides. So here's uh, one. Uh, one of our products is bromoethane. One of our products is bromomethane. And what was our other product here? Look what we also formed. We formed water. So if you'd like to balance your reaction here, you can see that not only do we get these two organic products, but we also form a molecule of water. This oxygen gets kicked out uh, eventually completely from both carbon groups. And these two protons from the HBr will combine with that to give a, uh, an equivalent of water as well. Now, ethers in general are going to go just that one, you know, that one reaction is the most common reaction we'll see, ether cleavage with HBr or HI. But uh, when we look at an example of an, of an epoxide uh, as a class of compounds, we'll find that epoxides can undergo lots of reactions 
Uh, they're much more reactive than an ordinary ether, and so that's what we'll spend the rest of our time talking about. So this is an epoxide, and uh, if we think about the reactivity we might have for an epoxide, I know this is a polar bond, and I know this is a polar bond, so that puts a lot of partial positive character on the, um, on the carbons of the epoxide ring. And what kind of reactivity do you um, expect for a partially positive carbon? I think it's going to be an electrophile. Okay, so this is what we're going to find for an e epoxide is it's going to be an e electrophile. In other words, it's going to be an E plus. It's going to be something that wants to react with nucleophiles. So the reaction that occurs is called a, a, a ring opening reaction. We're going to see lots of examples of those. The general mechanism that we have, the general thing is that we have an epoxide, we react to some nucleophile. That nucleophile is going to attack one of the carbons of the epoxide ring. And as usual, if we have a nucleophile attacking a carbon that already has four bonds, we have to break a bond as well. And one of these, um, one of these CO bonds is going to break. So if I attack this carbon, this CO bond is going to break. And so the product we get is we have an O minus, in this case, two carbon chain, and a nucleophile is now attached. So the nucleophile is attached to one carbon, and the next carbon, however, still has the oxygen from the epoxide attached. Now if you take a look at this mechanism, how would you describe the mechanism? Nucleophile attacks, kicks off a leaving group. Have we seen that before? Yeah, looks like SN2 mechanism, backside attack. Okay, but this is a strange example of an SN2 because normally, who is your leaving group in an SN2 mechanism? You've got to name a leaving group. Maybe we have a halide, chloride, bromide, iodide, <clears throat> or tosylate as a good leaving group, right? But we need a good leaving group. Our leaving group in this case is an alkoxide. We just kicked off an O minus that has no resonance stabilization. We've never seen that before. Why is it happening okay? We said that wouldn't happen in an ordinary um, uh, ether. Why is it happening here? Because in the course of this substitution reaction in this SN2, we're also opening up the epoxide ring. That three-membered ring has a lot of ring strain. And so by breaking that bond and, and opening the ring, we relieve the ring strain. So that is what makes epoxides very reactive and readily um, undergoing uh, reactions with nucleophiles. It's because of the ring strain they have in that three-membered ring. Any other ether is lacking that, and that's why we, would ex we, we don't expect SN2s in those cases. Okay, so let's see an example. If we take our simplest epoxide, it's called ethylene oxide. That's the... That's the epoxide made from ethylene, the two-carbon um, alkene. If we take ethylene oxide and we react with methanol, now we can react with methanol and acid or methanol with base, methoxide. So this little or means that uh, it can be either acid or base catalyzed, the mechanism. We're going to see two different mechanisms for this, but either way, we have a, a methoxy group acting as our uh, nucleophile. So the product we're going to get will have a methoxy group attached to one carbon and a hydroxyl group, an alcohol, on the other carbon. So it kind of follows that pattern of our nucleophilic ring opening. Here, the methoxy group is our nucleophile. And as usual, we're going to get an alcohol. Epoxide ring opening reactions are always going to give an alcohol product out the oxygen that used to be part of the epoxide ring will end up as a hydroxyl group on the carbon chain. It will end up as an OH group. Okay, let's one by one take a look at these two different reaction conditions and see what the mechanisms look like for this epoxide ring opening. You, see, you can see in this case we get the exact same product out, whether it's acid or base catalyzed. In some other cases we'll see how that, um, we, we might see some differences in those products. So what, what does the mechanism look like for an acid-catalyzed ring opening? Well, uh, again, here's the product that we're expecting. We're, we're going to get this methoxy group in. Here are our reaction conditions. We have the epoxide. We have methanol. We have an acid. What's going to happen is our first step in the reaction. It's going to be reaction with the acid. Remember, as soon as you see a strong acid present, your first step of your mechanism is going to be to protonate something. 
Where do we pronate? Well, we can pronate this oxygen, okay? But that doesn't really lead us anywhere. If we pronate the um, epoxide oxygen, that's going to be a, a better step to take, which means now we have a hydrogen attached to the oxygen. There's now just one lone pair here because the other one was used. Remember, proton transfer is always two arrows. And what does this oxygen look like now? It has one, two, three, four, five electrons. We know oxygen wants six. It's missing an electron, so we can protonate and give an O plus. So that's our first step is to protonate. Now, how does that help us? Why is that a good move to make? Well, our epoxide, remember, is an e electrophile, right? How about after protonating it? Do you think this structure now is something that's going to be more of an electrophile or less of an electrophile? We have a positive charge now in our structure. Is that something that's good for electrophiles that we associate with electrophilicity, being electron poor? Absolutely. So what we did now is we just made a great electrophile by protonating the epoxide. So we have a great super electrophile. Let's look around for a nucleophile. We look back to our reaction conditions. What nucleophile do we have? We have the alcohol. So we have methanol as our nucleophile. And what is that going to do? Well, this is every time a nucleophile sees an epoxide ring, same thing. It attacks the carbon and breaks the CO bond. SN2, attack the carbon, kick off the leaving group. But because this leaving group was, is still attached to the carbon chain, it doesn't just disappear from our structure. It stays connected to our structure. So we, this oxygen is now an OH, and it has its two lone pairs back, so now it's neutral again. And let's take a look at this oxygen. This was our methanol oxygen. What does this oxygen still have attached to it? It has uh, the CH3 and the OH. I'm sorry, the CH3 and the H. And uh, it has just one lone pair still. So this looks like another charged oxygen, right? One, two, three, four, five. Oxygen wants six, so this is another O plus. So we describe the second step as attack of the nucleophile. And we're almost there. We're getting towards our product. We, ha we still have an oxygen with a positive charge, so I know this can't be my final step. I know I can't be done with my mechanism. I need to get rid of that positive charge. How can I uh, get rid of it and end up with an oxygen with just two bonds? Well, it's this proton that's most easily removed. And so what we can show is A minus. We formed A minus in this first step when we used our strong acid. So we can show that A minus coming back and deprotonating the oxygen. So our third step of our mechanism is deprotonate. And there we are. We have our product, our substitution product, our ring opening product, where our nucleophile uh, has been attached and we have an alcohol where the epoxide used to be. So it's a three-step mechanism. We protonate, we attack, we deprotonate. We're going to see that pattern for an acid catalyzed mechanism. We're going to see that pattern again and again and again. First step is protonate. Then that makes it uh, possible to attack. And then we need to deprotonate to finish things up. Protonate, attack, deprotonate. OK, a couple other things I want to point out about this mechanism. Notice there aren't any O minus charges in acid. This is a strong, this would be a strong base like hydroxide. So there's no hydroxide, there's no alkoxide. Those are very strong bases, um, and so we can't have those. What, what kinds of charges do you see in this mechanism? You see that each structure is either neutral or it's positively charged. Only neutral or plus charges. And that is very much consistent with um, acid promoted or acid catalyzed mechanisms. Now I do see a negative charge here. I see this A minus. And what does A minus represent? Remember, if HA is a strong acid, A minus represents some very stable, weak conjugate base. And so it's around, but it's but it's not something that would that would be a strong base. It would it would be unstable. So that that is a reasonable species to have around. Um, but not hydroxide, not alkoxide. Okay, another thing I want to point out is this is an acid catalyst. You just need a, a, a drop of this acid 
because for every step where you use the acid, every protonation step, there's also a step where you get that acid back, you regenerate it, so it's a deprotonation step. Um, so it's used and regenerated, it's not consumed, that's our definition of a catalyst, something we don't need a stoichiometric amount, we don't need a full equivalent of this, because all we need is a little bit of it to get the reaction going, and every time we use, up the, use the acid, we'll have another step somewhere in the mechanism that recreates the acid to be used again. Now let's compare this with the, bat, the base catalyzed epoxide ring opening reaction. Okay, again we get the same product where we have this methoxy group attached and the alcohol here. Um, but our reaction conditions are different. Now we have methanol still but we use sodium methoxide as our reagent. Okay, so if we want to do our mechanism, we have our epoxide as an electrophile. We have sodium methoxide as a very strong nucleophile. This is a great nucleophile, strong nucleophile. So the very first step in this mechanism is going to be attack of that strong nucleophile onto the electrophile. Right, this is, the methoxide is something that would be great at doing in SN2. It doesn't need a push at all. And so we're simply going to attack the carbon and break the, um, kick off the leaving group. So the methoxy group is now attached. This is the carbon that the nucleophile attacked. It's the next carbon over that will have my epoxide oxygen. This oxygen now has three lone pairs on it. So let's check the formal charge here. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oxygen wants only six, so we have an extra electron. We'll get an O minus on that oxygen. Okay, looks like our reaction isn't done. We need to neutralize this. How do we take care of this O minus? We can, uh, we, we need to protonate to get to the OH. So we can use, where do we have a proton source? We have this methanol here as our solvent. So our methanol can come in and protonate the O minus. So our final step here is protonate. And we're done. It's not uncommon for a base promoted or base catalyzed mechanism to be shorter than an acid catalyzed mechanism. We're going to see lots of examples of this down the road. Okay, but there's our mechanism. We simply attack and then we protonate and we're done. So uh, let's take a look at this overall reaction and ask what kind of charges do you identify in this base catalyzed reaction? There's no positive charges, right? And that's going to be true in all of our base catalyzed reactions. We never want to have an O plus species. That's very strongly acidic, okay? Everything is either neutral or it has a negative charge. Neutral or negative charge, okay? And once again, just like the acid um, situation, this is a catalytic uh, reaction in terms of base. It's not consumed. Even though we used our methoxide here in the first, state, first, first step, the last step, the second step, regenerated it because the methanol acted, acted as a proton source and we remade the methoxide. So again, we just need a catalytic amount of this base. It doesn't even have to be methoxide. It could be any base. As long as methanol is our solvent, we're going to get this methoxy group down here because that's what we'll have in the largest uh, proportion. Now, we've seen an acid catalyzed mechanism, we've seen a base catalyzed mechanism, it's important to point out that you must have one of those conditions in order for the epoxide ring opening to take place. It must be either strongly acidic or strongly basic. If we try to do this reaction without the H2SO4 or without the sodium methoxide, what we're doing is we're taking a neutral epoxide, which is a weak electrophile. There's nothing super about this electrophile and we're mixing with methanol. Methanol itself is a weak nucleophile. And so if we're asking to bring these two reagents together, if we try this mechanism to just have the neutral epoxide, right, this is a neutral epoxide, and we have it being attacked by a neutral nucleophile, let's see what product we would get, what intermediate we would get. So this oxygen is now an O minus. And this oxygen is now an O plus. 
Okay, what's the problem with this mechanism? If you tried that uh, and you ended up with this structure, what, what alarms should be going off in your head as how this is not consistent with the mechanisms we've seen so far? You have an O+, plus, which is a strong base, very strong reactive base, and an O, an O-, minus, which is a strong base, and an O+, plus, which is an extremely strong, unstable, strong acid. Okay, these cannot coexist in the same reaction medium, okay? We will never see a uh, mechanism with an O plus and O minus in the same mechanism. So our mechanisms are either going to have negative charges throughout or positive charges throughout. We can't have an O plus and an O minus. So this is kind of a key that you've made a mistake and you need to back up and you need to look at your reaction conditions and see, well, do we actually have strongly nucleophilic, strongly basic conditions? or do we have strong acid conditions, okay? But the weak electrophile is not, uh, the neutral epoxide is too weak of an electrophile to be attacked by a neutral nucleophile, weak nucleophile like methanol. Okay, let's, let's look closer at this epoxide ring opening. Think about the stereochemistry and the regiochemistry of the reaction. The stereochemistry, we know it's an SN2 mechanism. SN2 means backside attack. What does that typically result in for the um, stereochemistry if this is happening on a chiral center? It leads to inversion of stereochemistry. And so that's going to be true um, in, in an epoxide ring opening, just like it is in a, in a, a straight chain SN2. So let's take a look at uh, these reaction conditions. I see I have an epoxide, and now I have NASH and methanol. Every time I have an epoxide, I know I have an electrophile. That part is, is not going to change. I have to look now at my reaction conditions to decide where is my nucleophile. Who is my nucleophile? I have NASH and I have methanol. Which component is going to be my strongest nucleophile? So who, who is my best nucleophile in this case? Well, NASH means I have an Na plus SH minus, right? So we have a negatively charged nucleophile, and here we have a neutral nucleophile. Who's the best one? The SH minus. Okay, not only is it negatively charged, but remember sulfur is bigger than oxygen, so it's polarizable. So, so for a couple reasons, this is the better nucleophile. So that's the nucleophile we're going to have. We're going, what, what is, how can we predict our product? That nucleophile is going to attack the carbon. In this case, either one is fine. Attack the carbon open up the ring and tell me about the stereochemistry of that attack. If the epoxide ring is coming out towards you as a wedge, that means the sulfur nucleophile has to come in from behind the plane so it will end up as a dash. So I have SH. What I have on this carbon is I still have this oxygen attached as a wedge. No, there is no chemistry that happened at this carbon so there's no reason to invert that center. This is still a wedge as an O minus. The purpose of this methanol here is our protic solvent. This is going to be our, our source of H plus. So we needed a protic solvent here to, um, so that we can get a neutral product out. Okay, so we get inversion of stereochemistry at the carbon undergoing any SN2 mechanism. Um, now is this going to, I, I, I kind of showed here that this is attacking right away uh, without really thinking about it, but, but which mechanism would you expect? Is this going to follow the acid um, catalyzed mechanism or the base catalyzed mechanism? Well, the question is, is there any strong acid? We know how to recognize strong acids. It's a pretty short list. Things like HX or H2SO4. It's another strong acid. Maybe nitric acid phosphoric acid, those sorts of things. Tosic acid is an acid we've seen before. Okay, these are the things that tell us we were under acidic conditions. Because there is no strong acid, um, we're going to be considered, we're going to be following the base mechanism here, the base catalyzed mechanism. And there's no strong base in this case either. It's the lack of a strong acid that causes us to follow a, a base mechanism. So in other words, we do step one, we're just going to come out and attack like I've shown here, and then step two, we're going to protonate. So you could try that mechanism to uh, convince yourself uh, that, that that would be uh, how, you, how you get to this product. 
Okay, the other thing I want to point out is, in this case, um, we, we can attack either of these carbons. If I attack the bottom carbon, what would my, what would my other structure look like? That's where the sulfur is attached down here as a dash. And then the OH would be attached to the other carbon, the top carbon, again, still as a wedge. So we're always going to get this anti-relationship of the incoming nucleophile and the um, epoxide oxygen. Right? We get this trans anti-type product, depending on how you're looking at your um, Product. <clears throat> and uh, in this case, we're, we're seeing because we started with an achiral starting material, right? We have uh, a meso compound here. We, uh, we can't form just a single chiral product. We're going to get a mixture of enantiomers here. This is an example of a racemate. So anytime we're dealing with stereochemistry, we have to be very careful about thinking, you know, do we need to say plus enantiomer? Are we expecting an enantiomer or not? Or are we not? Um, but, uh, but in terms of the carbon undergoing the SN2, we will observe an a inversion of stereochemistry like we've always seen. Okay, how about if we wanted to do this transformation? Um, we're starting with an alkene and we're going to a diol. The relationship of those two, H's, uh, two OHs are anti to one another, trans to one another. We have trans OHs. It's a trans 1,2 diol. Okay, we've seen a reaction that converts a, an alkene to a trans, uh, I'm sorry, to a diol. That was one of our oxidation reactions. Remember we saw KMNO4 or OSO4? Now that would give us two OHs, but what would the stereochemistry be for that transformation? Remember KMNO4 or OSO4 did a syn dihydroxylation. Both of those oxygens got added at the same time. So that gave cis OHs. This is, this is an example of syn uh, dihydroxylation. So we need another approach to, um, to get the trans out, but we just saw a reaction that does give a trans relationship between an OH and something else. Okay, and that would be if this had come from an epoxide If we had an epoxide and we opened up that epoxide, the nucleophile, the position of the nucleophile and the OH would be, um, would be trans to one another. So that might be a little harder to recognize here because they're both OHs, but you can open up an epoxide ring with an OH. And so, um, so that would, uh, would be a uh, possible synthesis. So let's imagine this, if we converted it first to the epoxide, and then we opened up that epoxide ring, that would give us uh, a trans diol. So let's think about those reaction conditions. How do we make epoxides? We just talked about the uh, synthesis of epoxides. One of the simplest ways is to do just an oxidation with something like MCPBA. A peroxy acid like MCPBA gives us the epoxide. And then how do we open up an epoxide ring? Well, we, need some, we can either have a strong nucleophile like sodium hydroxide. If we have water as our solvent, then we could attack and then protonate um, to give the transdiol. Or, remember, we could have base catalyzed reactions. We could all, also have acid catalyzed reactions. So if we just had H2O and acid, H2SO4, or you could just write H3O plus sometimes to represent that you have water in acidic conditions. Okay, that would also work. So you could protonate the epoxide ring and open up with water. This would also give the trans diols. Okay, so this is a nice um, synthetic uh, um, trick to know is that if we, if we need this trans relationship, we could go through the epoxide, so it's very useful. And in fact, instead of doing this in this two-step procedure, where first we make the epoxide and then we um, open it up, we can actually do this transformation in a single step in a single pot by using per acetic acid or peroxyacetic acid and, um, and water as our solvent. Okay, and what's cool about this is it does the, it makes the epoxide, it also gives acidic reaction conditions 
and it does so in the presence of the nucleophile. So what this does is it, it forms the epoxide in situ, meaning in the reaction conditions, in situ. This is a Latin term, you see it italicized. Um, we're making the epoxide in the, in the reaction and we're reacting that epoxide at the same time. So this is a handy set of uh, reagents to be familiar with as well. Anytime we want to do a, an anti-dihydroxylation. So a syndihydroxylation can happen with uh, osmium tetroxide or k 4 Anti-dihydroxylation can happen with uh, peroxy acid in the presence of water. <clears throat> so finally, let's talk about the regiochemistry of this epoxide ring opening. Let's say we have an epoxide like this, which is not symmetrical. We've, we've just been looking at symmetrical epoxide so far. Um, if we have a nucleophile attacking this epoxide, where does it go? In other words, it can attack this carbon or it can attack this carbon that, that would give two different products. Anytime we're deciding what region or what site of a substrate to react, we call that regiochemistry. So um, the regiochemistry of these epoxide ring openings actually depends on the mechanism of the reaction. And we saw base catalyzed, we saw acid catalyzed, let's look at them one by one. Okay, if we are in base, okay, in other words, there's no strong acid present. So we, it's not necessarily necessary that we're looking for the presence of a base, um, but we are looking for the absence of an acid. In that case, remember the very first step of our mechanism is right here. We have some strong nucleophile, negative charge, strong nucleophile is attacking the neutral epoxide. So that was our very first step. A nucleophile attacks a neutral epoxide. So in that case, what we're looking at is just a straight out SN2 mechanism. And how is an SN2 mechanism going to be controlled? It's going to be governed by sterics. In other words, oh, there's a typo there, sorry. It's going to uh, attack the less hindered carbon. So we come back here, we see that this is a secondary carbon. It's got two carbon groups attached. This is a primary carbon. It's just got one carbon group atta attached. And so um, which is going to be the faster SN2, the better SN2? The one where it goes after the primary carbon. So the nucleophile goes to the less substituted carbon. It's governed by sterics. It's a plain old SN2, and, uh, and, and so we do what we would normally expect for our regiochemistry. Okay? Now, it's a, when it's an acid, in other words, there is a strong acid present. Remember, the very first step of our mechanism is going to be protonate the epoxide. And the attack then happens on that protonated epoxide. So we're going to have this, this species, a protonated epoxide, getting attacked by a weaker nucleophile, right? some kind of neutral nucleophile. And we're asking the same question, which site is going to be, uh, is going to be preferred? Okay, we have a nucleophile attacking a protonated epoxide. The presence of that charge means that it's not a simple SN2 any longer. The way we describe it is we say it's an SN2, but it has some SN1 character. Now in SN1, we describe as having a carbocation that gets attacked by a nucleophile. There is no carbocation here. There's the, both of these carbons are just partial positive. Okay, so let's keep that in mind. It's partial positive, not a full positive. Okay, that's why we're still describing as an SN2. It's still backside attack. But the presence of that partial positive gives it some SN1 character. Okay, which means we're no longer being governed simply by the SN2 sterics, the backside attack sterics. The presence of that charge means that we're doing, have it, we are concerned a little bit more with electronics, electron density. And now what we look at is we see, okay, this partial positive is on a secondary carbon. So we have a secondary partial positive. This partial positive is a primary partial positive. Which of those partial positives, those delta pluses, it has more electrophilic character? Which of those carbons better handles the partial positive? Well, just like carbocation uh, stability goes, the more carbon groups we have, the better. So this secondary partial positive 
This is better. It is uh, more, it, it's the better electrophile. It is the more partial positive of the two carbons. And so in this case, the nucleophile doesn't want to go to the primary center. It wants to go to the uh, secondary center, the more substituted. So in this case, because we're being governed by electronics and not sterics, the nucleophile goes to the more substituted carbon. So we end up getting exactly opposite regiochemistries. If it's protonated, it goes to the more substituted carbon. If it's neutral, it goes to the less substituted carbon. Let's take a look at a few examples. Okay, here we have a, 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 a not symmetrical epoxide. So in other words, attack at either carbon would give a different product. So let's look at this. What if we reacted to this with sodium cyanide and water? Sodium cyanide and water. What we have here is a very strong nucleophile. We have water as our solvent. We have no strong acid. And so that means our mechanism is going to be simply the cyanide attacking the epoxide right off the bat. And which of these two carbons is it going to prefer to attack? We're looking at a plain old SN2 mechanism, so it's going to be governed by sterics. We have a secondary carbon over here. We have a tertiary carbon over here. It's going to prefer to go to the less sterically hindered carbon. So what does our product look like? Okay, here's our carbon chain. How do we draw our uh, epoxide ring opening products without going through the complete mechanism? This is the carbon that got attacked by the cyano group. So it's attached here. The other carbon is, is, uh, didn't get attacked, so it still has the oxygen here. And because we have a protic solvent here, we have something to work this up. We're going to get this alcohol. So notice the pattern of epoxide ring opening. We always have the nucleophile added to the carbon next to the carbon that has the OH remaining. OK, so this is, uh, so this, this is going to be like our base catalyzed one and it's controlled by sterics. Now, take a look at my stereochemistry. Why did I draw my cyano group up here and not down here? Shouldn't I have drawn it down here because it's backside attack? Well, yes, except no stereochemistry has been shown for the starting material. So even though the cyanide is attacking at the bottom here, whether I draw the CN up here or down here, it doesn't matter. This uh, chiral carbon has not been shown any stereochemistry, so we could just draw it anywhere we want. It's, it's, um, stereochemistry is only given relevant when we're dealing with a chiral carbon, and the stereochemistry of that chiral carbon is, is um, indicated at the beginning. Okay, how about the next case? If we react this with HI, the same epoxide with HI, now I see that we have a strong acid. Uh, do I have a nucleophile? Remember, an epoxide is always an electrophile, so our goal in looking at our reaction conditions is to find our nucleophile. Well, there it is. We have HI, so I minus will be our nucleophile. So where is that uh, nucleophile going to prefer to add? Remember, we're going to protonate our epoxide first. And where will that nucleophile prefer to add? It's going to prefer this tertiary partial positive because this is more electrophilic. And so what does our product look like? Again, here's our carbon chain. Our iodide is going to be attack, attached to the carbon on the right, the more substituted carbon. And the alcohol, the OH, is going to be attached to the other carbon. Again, no, no worry about stereochemistry here in this case because no stereochemistry has been shown for our starting um, epoxide. OK, so these are acid conditions. And so it's it, uh, controlled by the um, better partial positive. Okay, little note here, little note, this is not about the more stable carbocation. We've seen that argument before. When we looked at Markovnikov's rule in addition to alkenes, when we had a carbocation into, in the mechanism, absolutely we always want to go for the more stable carbocation. Why is it not correct here to say that this is this, the reason I get this regiochemistry is because it's the more stable carbocation. 
because the mechanism has no carbocation. It has a protonated epoxide. The I minus attacks this. In other words, the ring doesn't open first and then have the iodide atta attack. The iodide attacks, and that's what forces open the ring. Okay, so we want to be very careful not to mention anything about a carbocation when we're discussing epoxide ring opening reactions, but, but instead refer to the partial positive in the intermediate and the transition state, um, and, and that's what's, what's governing it. <clears throat> okay, how do I know it's an SN2 here? How do I know it's backside attack and not a stepwise where the ring opens and then the um, nucleophile adds in? Well, the stereochemistry of the mechanism is what gives evidence that it's an SN2. Remember, we observe backside attack. We observe, we observe inversion of stereochemistry, so we know it must be a concerted um, substitution and not a stepwise substitution. What, what other nucleophiles can we have? Well, we've seen Grignards and hydrides attacking carbonyls. These would be great for attacking epoxides as well. So let's see an example of that. Um, we have an epoxide, okay, we know that's our electrophile. So we look in our reaction condition step one here, we look for a nucleophile. Um, okay, LiAlD4, I've seen LiAlH4 before, that's lithium aluminum hydride. What do you think this reagent would be? That we could call this lithium aluminum deuteride, deuteride and just like hydride is a source of H minus, Deuteride is a source of D minus, and D represents a deuterium. It's simply a uh, an isotope of hydrogen. It's it's uh, hydrogen that has a, a neutron in there, and so uh, but we we use it so commonly that it has its own name. And so anytime you see a D in a structure, you're just going to treat it just like you would a hydrogen. It's going to do the same reactions. So just like this was an H minus, this is going to be a D minus. We'll keep those quotes around it um, because it, it will always be coordinated with the aluminum and, and, and it's the aluminum that's delivering it. It's not ionic. Okay, but that's going to be our nucleophile. We have a D minus. So now we need to decide. We, we know what we're adding. We have to decide um, where are we adding it. We have to decide the, the stereochemistry. We want to consider both the regiochemistry. Where are we adding it? We want to consider the stereochemistry. What is the stereochemistry of that addition? Because we're clearly dealing with some chiral centers here. We have some dashes and wedges in our, in our starting material. Okay, so what we need to decide for the regiochemistry, we need to decide is this an acid catalyzed mechanism or a base catalyzed mechanism? Well, we take a look at our reaction and it's tempting to see, uh, to think that it might be acid catalyzed because I certainly see some acid here. I see some H3O plus. But, but see these numbers here? This tells us that the first thing we're doing is reaction with, with lithium aluminum deuteride. And after that's done is when we add in the acid. Okay, so the important thing to note is there's no acid in step one, in the first step. In fact, the reason this is separated and we don't have them combined like we did before, you can't have acid in the presence of a really strong nucleophile like a Grignard or an hydride. You can't mix water with that because that, those would quench those. So with those really strong nucleophiles, what we do is we do it in a two-step procedure. First, we react it with that, with that nucleophile, and then we do a, an aqueous workup to protonate anything that needs protonating. Okay, so this is going to be our base type mechanism. In other words, we're, we have nothing in step one to protonate this epoxide, so it's just being attacked right off by the, by the nucleophile. It's the neutral epoxide being attacked. And so how are we going to decide where it goes? It's just a plain old SN2, so it's going to be governed by sterics. So let's look at the two carbons um, that are being attacked. How would you describe this first carbon, or the, the carbon on the right? This is a secondary carbon, has two carbons attached. How about this carbon? Now be careful, it might be tempting to say it's tertiary because we see this terbutyl group, but if you look carefully, this is also secondary. Okay, but um, is there a difference in their sterics? Absolutely. The one group attached here is just a methyl group. The other group attached here is this terpyl group offering a lot of sterics. So most definitely the less sterically um, hindered one will be the carbon on the right. And there's our mechanism. Okay, but you want to be careful in your explanation if you were asked to describe, explain why this regiochemistry was 
um, observed, you want to be careful not to say it prefers the secondary over the tertiary site. You want to say it prefers the carbon without the terpedo group because uh, uh, it's going to be less sterically crowded. Okay, so um, let's draw our carbon chain. We can keep our carbon chain in the plane here because our epoxide was drawn as a wedge. We're going to add the deuterium here and tell me about the stereochemistry of that group. It has to be backside attack. So if the epoxide is sticking out, that means the deuterium comes from behind. So we can keep our carbon chain the same and show the deuterium coming in from the back here. And what's the stereochemistry? What's on this other carbon? Still as a wedge, we have an O um, minus. If we just show our mechanism, we can show it stepwise just as a little, uh, little review here. We would get the O minus first as a wedge. But then after step two, when we did our workup, that is what we would use to protonate to get to our final product. So you wouldn't need to show this whole mechanism for a predict the product, but I just want to add a little detail here so we're clear on the purpose of that, um, of that aqueous workup. So step, step one, we, we still are doing our attack and our protonate, but in this case it required two step, separate steps for our reagents because our nucleophile was uh, too strong of a reagent to, to um, tolerate a, a protic acid. Um, so we'd have to do it stepwise. Um, any enantiomer here? Plus enantiomer? I know we have that reaction every time to say, yes, I want to get the enantiomer as well, because I've drawn a chiral product here. This is clearly chiral. So where would the enantiomer come from? What does the enantiomer look like? That would have a wedged deuterium and a dashed oxygen. How could that come from this starting material? It couldn't. Because we were just given a single enantiomer as our starting material, it's okay to have just a single enantiomer product here. And that's going to be um, common for, for many of these products. So, so uh, this is the only product. This is the only regiochemistry. This is the only stereochemistry. We do get this single enantiomer out as our major product. Okay, so let's take a look at another example. Here we have uh, an alcohol and uh, bromine. And in our first step, we're reacting it with sodium. Now, sodium all by itself means that it's not sodium plus, it's actually sodium metal. Sodium metal has that electron it's dying to get rid of, so that makes it a good reducing agent. So where have we seen that as a reagent? We've seen it uh, reduce an alkyne to a, a transalkene. That's a possibility. We've also seen, seen it reduce um, any acidic proton. And, uh, and, and reduce that and give off hydrogen gas. And as a result then, we're going to get the alkoxide. So, um, <clears throat> so to make an alkoxide, we could, use a strong, we could use a base or we could use a metal like sodium, lithium, potassium to do a redox reaction to the same, same process. So step one here, we make the alkoxide. Now is that our final product then after the first step? Or is there something that alkoxide can do uh, before we get to our second step. Well, I just made an alkoxide in the presence of an alkyl halide, uh, and so I, I think we're going to have a reaction take place here. Furthermore, the OH is a wedge, the O minus is a wedge, and the bromine is a dash, which means when we want to do a backside attack, we're perfectly set up stereochemistry to do that anti um, attack. And so, sure enough, we're going to get attack of the alkoxide to kick off the leaving group. And we're going to make this epoxide. So step one, after we deprotonate the OH, we're going to um, do an intramolecular SN2, an intramolecular Williamson ether synthesis, and we would get an epoxide after step one. Okay, well an epoxide is an electrophile, so I'm hoping in step two we have some kind of nucleophile. Who is that nucleophile? Well, I see that I have uh, NaOH. So that's Na+, plus, which means I have hydroxide, HO-, minus, and I also have water. Now this 18 is uh, simply an isotopic label, and so it's a way, it's useful to um, be able to track the incoming OH and, and track them as a different oxygen than the one that's already here. Just like we used deuterium in the last example, that was useful so we could see where the new hydrogen, the deuterium ended up, even though we already had a hydrogen in the structure, this labeled um, oxygen is going to be doing the same thing. So we have hydroxide, labeled hydroxide, 
as our nucleophile. And uh, that's going to open up the epoxide ring. So when we do that, we have to think about two things. We have to think, think about the regiochemistry, because in this case, our two carbons are differently substituted. And we have to think about the stereochemistry. So how do we decide the regiochemistry? Well, we need to decide whether it's an acid catalyzed or a base catalyzed mechanism. What do you think in this case? Well, surely I see hydroxide in here, clearly base catalyzed. There's clearly no strong acid here. So um, this is going to be our base mechanism, which means our hydroxide is simply going to attack the epoxide, as shown, the neutral epoxide. And so it's going to be our uh, ordinary SN2. There's no SO1 character, ordinary SN2, so it's going to be about sterics. So when I compare my two carbons, I have a secondary carbon over here, I have a tertiary carbon over here, and, uh, and so my hydroxide is going to attack the carbon on my left and open up the ring. Tell me about the stereochemistry of that, uh, of that SN2. Since the epoxide is a wedge, that means the new oxygen has to come in from behind to do backside attack, must come in as a dash. So here's my 18, my labeled oxygen is on the carbon on the left as a dash. And what do we have on the right? This stereochemistry remains unchanged. There's, changed. There's no reaction here. So my methyl group is a dash and my oxygen is a wedge. Because I have um, a protic solvent here, then I can expect to protonate this after I open up the ring. So I have an O minus and then I can protonate it to get this OH. So we've, we've considered, we formed an epoxide, then we opened it up, we considered the regiochemistry, we considered the stereochemistry. It's okay to have this single enantiomer as my product because I started with a single enantiomer um, as, as a starting material. Looks kind of interesting, the nucleophile has the same stereochemistry as this leaving group. How do we, it looks like we had retention of stereochemistry. How did we do that? Well, really there were two SN2s. There was an inversion in this first SN2, and then there was an inversion in the second SN2. So a double inversion ends up giving us retention of stereochemistry. That makes this problem an interesting one. Okay, and finally, let's look at an example of a synthesis. If I asked you to synthesize this target molecule, and I gave you a hint, I said you should start with some kind of epoxide and some kind of nucleophile, that will help you maybe see the pattern in the target molecule that that makes it look like a product that might have come from a, uh, an epoxide ring opening. So what do those ring opening products look like? Well, they always have an OH on one carbon, and the next carbon over, we have a nucleophile that's been added. Okay, now it is possible to add a methyl and an ethyl, or, or an ethyl via a Grignard reagent, but this oxygen group most definitely, you know, he couldn't have been there in the epoxide form. So this was my nucleophile. This was the group that um, was added, so that's kind of the disconnection that we're making here. If you want to imagine doing, in your retrosynthesis, right, we're asking what starting materials do I need. You can almost imagine doing that backwards reaction where the oxygen, the epoxide ring closes back up and kicks the leaving group out. So in, instead of just doing a disconnection, you can think about that reverse mechanism. Um, that imaginary reverse mechanism. The, car the stereochemistry on this carbon stays the same. I still have a methyl back and a hydrogen out. Okay, but I want you to think carefully about the stereochemistry of this. What did the stereochemistry used to be over here? We have a wedge and a dash that so we need to fill in. What did these groups used to look like so that after the nucleophile added in, we ended up with this stereochemistry at the carbon? Okay, now think about what it means to be a, an SN2 and do a, an inversion of stereochemistry. I want to point this out because when our leaving group is in the plane, it's, it's a little different than, than some of the examples we've seen. Just by having this oxygen come in from in the plane, it causes the, the dash and wedge bonds to be pointing out in the up direction, and then the inversion now points them in the down direction. Okay, so because my ethyl group was a wedge and my methyl group was a dash, there's still going to be a wedge and a dash when this nucleophile adds in. Okay? 
My nucleophile, because my leaving group in this case, let's think about it in the forward direction. My nucleophile in this case is in the plane. I'm sorry, my leaving group is in the plane. That means my nucleophile must come in from in the plane. Approach from in the plane. It's not going to come in as a wedge or a dash because my leaving group is a straight line. So that means the nucleophile comes in, ends up as a straight line. So the inversion, you, you have already seen the 180 degrees. It used to be up here, and now it's down here. There's your inversion. And the other two groups are simply like your umbrella flip. The one group that was pointing out towards you is still pointing out towards you. But instead of going down, it's going up a little bit. There's no way for these groups to do this. That would not be, that would be again, a double inversion. You can check your stereochemistries here. If you want to assign RNS before and assign RNS afterwards, you will be able to confirm that they've in, indeed inverted if, you, uh, if you're not convinced by this or if you're having some trouble with this. Okay, of course, working with a model can help as well. Okay, so this is my epoxide. That's my electrophile. So I know I need a nucleophile. Who is my nucleophile? Needs to be this ethoxy group. So maybe I can have sodium ethoxide. That would certainly be a nucleophile. And, uh, and th this might be a, a good uh, way to do this synthesis. Okay, but what we need to do after we do our planning is we need to check to make sure that would work. Now, if I took these two, um, this epoxide and ethoxide, and I went to predict the product, would this give the target molecule? Well, how do we decide that? We take a look at our reaction. We think about the regiochemistry. We think about the stereochemistry. or We need to confirm it as, it, as if it were to predict the product. So um, do we have acid catalyzed conditions or base catalyzed conditions here? Clearly, this is a strong base. So there's no acid here, which means the, methox the ethoxy group would go where? It would go to the less sterically hindered carbon. So what, would, what product would I get? I would get the product where my ethoxy group adds to the carbon on the left, and the alcohol would end up on the carbon on the right. Now let's think about that stereochemistry here. My ethoxy group would come in from down here, so that kicked off the oxygen. What happens to this methyl and this hydrogen? The hydrogen is still a wedge, but it's up here a little bit. The methyl is still a dash, but it's up here a little bit. Okay, this would be the product formed uh, by the synthesis. Is that the product we want? No, that's the wrong regiochemistry. I don't want the OH on this tertiary carbon. I want the OH over here on the secondary carbon. Okay, so this is not going to work. This gives the wrong product. It gives the wrong regiochemistry. So how do I force my nucleophile into this carbon? I want the, the nucleophile to, uh, to attack this carbon. How do we force it over there? How do we get the nucleophile to go to the more substituted carbon? We do it by using a strong acid so that it will be the protonated epoxide that gets, uh, that gets attacked. So how do I do that? I don't use methoxide. I use methanol. I'm sorry. I don't use ethoxide. I use ethanol and a strong acid. I can't H2SO4. I can't use ethoxide anymore, what would happen to ethoxide if I tried to mix that with acid? It would simply get pertinated. So remember, it's okay to have a weak nucleophile. We need to have a weak nucleophile when we're in acidic conditions. It's impossible to have a strong nucleophile in acidic conditions. Okay, so I would use ethanol, NH2SO4, and now when I go to predict the product, I protonate the oxygen and my ethanol goes to the more substituted carbon and I get this um, uh, target molecule out instead. Now this is an interesting thing to point out. I have a tertiary carbon here. I'm doing an SN2 on a tertiary carbon. This is the first time we've ever seen that, and this is the only time we're ever going to see that. What's unique about this mechanism is that it's not an ordinary SN2. We've always said SN2s don't happen on tertiary carbons. What's different about this mechanism? Because of the strong acid, because we're protonating the oxygen, it now is an SN2 with some SN1 character, right? So it's that SN1 character, it's that presence of that positive charge that, that makes it different from an ordinary SN2. And now we go to the more substituted carbon, even if it's tertiary, and we do our backside attack. Okay, so we saw lots of examples here about ethers, how to 
um, synthesize ethers, what reactions do ethers undergo, what are some physical properties. Of course, the most interesting ether that we have is the epoxide. So we saw lots of examples of epoxide ring opening reactions and stereochemistry, regiochemistry implications of those. Hope to see you next time.